Sal Barry. Because everybody is like, oh, PMG this and PMG that. And Tim Parrish. As everybody knows, I only chase high-end sets. No, I'm just kidding. I never buy anything high-end. This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I am Sal Barry and with me is Tim Parrish. And today our big topic is hockey Hall of Fame trading card sets. We're going to talk about some of the Hockey Hall of Fame trading card sets that have come out over the years because the Hockey Hall of Fame induction is coming up this weekend. We're also going to touch on some of the uh, upcoming releases for hockey cards that are coming out this year. So, Tim, how you been, man? It's been a while since we've last chatted with one another. Oh, you know, if I had a tail, I would wag it, but, you know. Over here living the dream and trying to not make everybody jealous. I didn't know that dog face gremlins had tails, but I guess they do. They come in all forms. Mm-hmm. All forms. They could have a tail. They could not have a tail. They could have fur. They could be hairless. You never know. Do they bounce like bumbles? Um, it depends on how much they had to drink. <laughs> Since, Sometimes since, they just fall down and they don't yeah, get back. Yeah, you know, we're not like weevils. We fall down and we don't get back up. So, a uh, quick announcement. Uh, as we talked about on the last show, the Sports Card Expo in Toronto is coming up this weekend. So, it is Thursday, November 10th to Sunday, November 13th. I will be there at the show Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Some people think I'm going to have a table at the show. That is false. I am just going to be running around the show, buying hockey cards, trying to talk to as many people as possible, and trying to buy hockey cards. Because, honestly, I haven't really gone to a show, a big show, where I've gotten to walk around and buy stuff, not since the National in 2019. Because every National since then, I've been a vendor. Every Rosemont show since then, I've been a vendor. I did go to one or two smaller shows to buy, but I've never gone to the expo. I've always wanted to do this. This is a big bucket list thing for me that I've always wanted to do. So I'm excited that I'm going. Just real quick, I want to say, if you see me at the show, I'm going to be wearing a Puck Junk logo t-shirt. If you want one, I'll give you one. I'm going to bring a bag of t-shirts to give around to people. You know, if you're a listener of the podcast or you're a fan of what Tim and I write or put on Twitter or whatever, come up to me. Uh, If I don't recognize you, just say, hey, Sal, I'm so-and-so. I listen to your show. And I'll give you a shirt if you want. The other thing is that I'm going to be on a panel discussion on Saturday at 4 p.m., on the main stage. It's going to be a panel discussion about hockey card collecting. And I would love it if it was just a bunch of people who knew who the heck I was and liked the podcast who showed up. That would make it a little easier. And I'll tell you this, man, I did a panel discussion once about sports trading cards, but this was at the Midwest Pop Culture Association. And I think five people came to watch the panel and it was so crushing to like want to talk about this thing and like almost nobody came. I don't think that's going to be the case here because card collectors like to talk about card stuff. But when I went to this pop culture convention, it was more focused on like stuff like Barbie and GI Joe and my little pony and stuff like that. So anyway, I'm excited about the expo. I wish I could say more about it, but I'm just too jealous and I'm jealous to my bones that I will burst out in a fit of rage. And I don't want to do that because we have a show to do. So. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I wasn't trying to do that. <laughs> I, no, I mean, what hockey collector on earth wouldn't want to go to the Sport Card Expo? I mean, come on. I've always wanted to go there, too. And... Oh, another thing. They're going to have a trade night on Saturday night, and I'll be there as well. And I'm going to be bringing all my Ottawa Senators cards, all my Winnipeg Jets, Edmonton Oilers, Toronto Maple Leafs, Calgary Flames, all the Canadian teams. I've already set those cards aside. I have them grouped by team because I want to trade them. That's the idea of trading cards, right? To trade them. People in Canada actually like Canadian teams? Yes. Wow. I know, man. All these Winnipeg Jets cards that I've been saddled with for the past, you know, 10 years, I can finally move on. I was going to say get rid of, but that sounded mean, so I can... Hope they fly out of my collection. 
because they're Jets cards. I don't know how many people would be able to reciprocate for you with Blackhawks cards. While you're no, I don't there. necessarily want Blackhawk cards. I guess the thing is, is like when you have cards for a long time, I could trade them. It's just that trading over the border via mail is expensive, as we both Holy. know. Ha, huh, trust me, I know. Every time I send something up there, it's for just a simple, small bubble mailer. It's at least 14 bucks. Yeah. If not more. I think the last thing I sent up there, it was 20 something because it had to be a little bigger than a bubble. So probably 2210, if memory serves me correctly. Yeah. Unless they increased their rate again. They did because they, they have the temporary holiday bump, which after the holidays will stay bumped like it always does. So it's not really um, a bump, it's a slope. Yeah, kind of. And even with the shipping discounts through like pirate ship and stuff like that, it's still fairly expensive. And, you know, it's a lot when you look at it, you know, if you're buying cards on the various sites that you can buy cards, let's just say eBay, for example, and you get people that are selling from Canada, buying from Canada isn't as much. But then when you turn around and you're like, okay, I'm going to do trading, everybody that reaches out is like, what do you have for this? And what do you have for that? And it's 90% hockey. And there's so many people that are from Canada, which makes sense. Just trading, you know, okay, I got 50 cards. Here's 50 cards. Let's swap. And then you turn around and you're like, okay, they just sent me a package and it cost them $3 and 50 cents. And I sent them a package with the same amount of cards and it cost me $14. So it's like the $3 worth of cards that I get cost me $14. <laughs> Yeah. So if you do the math and subtract out the difference, well, you're talking about at least eleven dollar difference between the shipping. So it's crazy. Well, I hope people come to the trade night. It is a twenty five dollar ticket to go to that, but it's going to have food and drink and live music from when I well a DJ. I don't know if that counts as live music. No, music from not. a person hitting play on a machine. Yeah, that's not live music. No yeah. offense to the DJs of the world. And I appreciate what DJs do because I couldn't do it, but it's not really live music. What right. they're doing is live, especially if they're putting on a show and a performance with it, you know, but the average DJ that gets hired by a bar because they don't want to pay an actual band on a Friday night or Saturday night. Yeah, I, that's not, that's not live music. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no apologies necessary. So let's touch on some of these uh, new releases that are coming out. So I'm just going to read off the list to everybody to see you can all hear all the good cards that are on the horizon. And then we'll just talk about a few of these. So November, so this week we got 2223 Upper Deck Series 1, which will be what, out just in time for the Expo. What everybody's also, been waiting for. Everybody's been waiting for. And then scheduled for... This month, we got 2122 Synergy, Alert, Metal Universe, Game Used, SPX, OPG Platinum, Credentials, Ultimate, and then 2021 The Cup. So all of that's coming out in November, allegedly. Allegedly, correct. Allegedly. It's like they're really clearing out these sets, these 2122 sets. I mean, never mind, we're now in 2223. It's going to be like this for a while. But you'll see then in December, it continues. Then we have 2122 SP Authentic, 2122 SP, 2122 Premier, 2122 Clear Cut. And then from tops, we have the 2223 Tops sticker set, which you know I'll be collecting, and then the 2023 Leaf Bang Hockey. Okay, I gotta ask because this is the first time I'm hearing about this. First time you're hearing about what? Bang Hockey. Did I read that right? Yeah, that's what it says. That's what shows up on pretty much most of the release calendars. You know I it is? don't really know too much about it, to be honest oh, with you. Oh, come on, man. You're the guy who pretends you're going to buy Leaf hockey, but never does. <laughs> or I almost mean, never does. So they have Bang Baseball. And so I'm going to imagine it's going to be similar to Bang Baseball. And if that's the case, then it's a buyback set. So essentially, they've just bought back cards and done whatever to them. Nine times out of ten, it's probably took some of their autograph stock. And put a sticker auto. 
Uh, there's been a mm. bunch of people floating around online saying how certain companies shouldn't be allowed to do that, but there were already lawsuits, I don't know how many years ago or whatever, where basically it was ruled that they can. Yeah, I think the baseball boxes are like 225 bucks or 230 bucks a box, and it's one card per box, and it's just some some buyback. So I'm going to guess that it's going to be something similar to that. I haven't seen pictures or seen checklists or anything, but if they keep it consistent among the sports, I would imagine that's what it's going to be. Okay, also coming out in December, we have 2022 Leaf Art of Hockey and 2122 Leaf Lumber. So Leaf is really going to be ramping it up at the end of the year. And then in January, we got two releases on the schedule. We got 2122 Stature and then 2223 Leaf in the Game Used. And then finally in February so far, we have planned 2223. Oh, finally, the 2223 sets other than Series 1 and uh, MVP, which we've already talked about. But finally, 2223 sets coming out in February. We got 2223 Artifacts, Upper Deck Series 2. Trilogy and finally OPG is actually coming out March 15th. That's what so it says. I know that really annoys you that it got pushed out so late because you're you're such a big fan of OPG. I mean, I am well, too, but I think you're a bigger fan of OPG. You gotta think of it in terms of this way. And I understand that we've moved on and what this isn't the old days anymore, and we can't rely on things being like they were. And I get all that. But when you were when you've collected for a long period of time and you've been loyal to different brands you expect things to have at a certain time so every year what do we always expect at the beginning of the year well we see mvp and we see opg and we see artifacts and then series one comes out and that's usually been the process for the last 10 15 years easily right and so now because of the various printing obstacles that that manufacturers have run into and packaging and all of that kind of thing you've got beginning of the year sets that traditionally still have players in their old uniforms and don't have them in their quote-unquote traded uniforms yet not coming out until middle of the season so a march release for opichi that's normally out in august or or september it's rough but I'd rather have it in February than not at all. Well, according to this, March. Or March, February, March, whenever. And of course, these are all tentative dates. Nothing set in stone. Any of those can change. But this is just what seems to be consistent amongst the release calendar as of this recording. Yeah, I mean, everything's subject to change. Still, I can't just believe the absolute avalanche of 2122 sets that we're going to get this month. I the mean, thing is, I don't necessarily know that we're going to see them this month. They were on the slot to come out in November at one point or another from when they were announced, you know, with a tentative, this should be like a November date or this should be a December date. And, you know, I'm air quoting because people can't see me. So mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. imagine me air quoting. So they may not. The Leaf sets, the art of hockey that's been on the list every month and it just keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed. So I imagine if we don't see these sets, obviously they'll drop to the December list. And if they don't show up on there, they'll drop to the next list. The reason why they're still on there, no one's made an announcement that they're not going to make them. Right. You know, announcements were made and sell sheets were listed and they were put on people's calendars. So resellers have been advertising them and some have been pre-selling. So until manufacturers turn around and say, yeah, no, we're not going to do that now. Kind of like Upper Deck did with that classic signature set that we talked about probably a year ago that was okay. on the sell sheets and haven't heard a peep about it since then. I don't see it on anybody's list anymore either. That was supposed to be a 2020 product. And mm. It's disappeared. So, But all of these that we're naming all the way through March – there's still a 2020 product on there, and that's the cup. 2021, the cup? It's 2021. Yeah. Yeah, still, though. I mean, that's like two years ago. Yeah. And so we so still have this cup ago. product that's going to come out, and 
folks that don't know and follow how the progression of that goes, I can hear it now. The people saying, oh, so-and-so rookies aren't in here. There's no Owen Power. There's no Matty Veneers. Well, that's not this year's set. Well, there's no Alexei Lafreniere. There's no... Well, no, that would be know. 2021. Uh, Lafreniere that, and Kaprizov. That'd be 21-22. No, no, that was 2021. Remember last friend year was drafted in 2020? They had the draft in like October. And then the season actually happened in 2021 and he got off to that really slow start and his rookie card tanked to like 90 bucks. Who was in last year then? We had Moritz Sider, Trevor Zegras. We had Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How soon I forget. No, um, it, it, you know what? No, dude, honest mistake because it's all kind of blurring together. Because well, that's if you the think thing. About we're, it, we're piling on top of each other. 20s on 21s on 22s. It's like, what the heck? But we had the the 2019-20 season ended at the end of September of 2020 when the Lightning won. And then we had the 2020-21 season start a couple months later. And that was just the beginning of the 2021 calendar year. That was that 56-game schedule, if I remember correctly. So we basically had like a season end and then like another season start and end and then like another season start in like a 13 month span if you think about it and then we've had these cards coming out at like different times like kind of mixed up right we're getting 2020 products and 2021 products and 2022 products and i mean i have been guilty of opening a box and looking and going vitali craps off Oh, right. Okay. This is from 2021. You know what I mean? Like, so it's an easy thing to do. It kind of all blurs together, honestly. (laughs) In the last couple of years, haven't been as neat as the previous seasons where hockey starts in October, hockey ends in June, and then it starts up again in October, right? I mean, it did start up in October this season and last season, but even still, it just feels a little off. Yeah. I went brain dead there for a second, but yeah. Mm. But I mean, you see what I'm saying. So you end up with a product that's that old and your people are like, what? Where are all these guys? Or where are all these guys? Well, guess what? They're not there because this is a different year. So, but I mean, it'll be interesting to see how many of these actually come to fruition this far along in the game. Because if we're still just getting endless 21 releases, halfway through this current season there's going to be i hate to say it there's going to be a lot of complaining anyway i mean blue check marks or not but people are going to lose their crap <laughs> let's put it that way <laughs> because there's going to be a, where are the current product and they're still just trying to get caught up so i hope it doesn't come to that i hope stuff can get rolled out in a timely fashion i also don't want to get deluged with, with sets you know I don't want there to be a week where there's six releases and then two weeks later there's 12 more releases just for them to get caught up because that would be kind of ridiculous too. Deluge. That was the word I wanted to say, but I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I said avalanche instead. So I went with a rock slide instead of a downpour of water. Either way, a tsunami of card releases, if you will. Well, that kind of reminds me of like when I was working my first job 30 years ago in a comic book store. And I remember sometimes schedules would get messed up and you might have like a ton of comic books come out in one week because there might be a delay or something. And then I know people would be like, well, I would buy this new series, but, you know, we've had Batman, Spider-Man, X-Men and Punisher and Wolverine and Spawn all come out in the same week. So the people would be like, well, I'm buying these books. I just don't have the budget to buy something that I don't normally buy or to buy something a little off my beaten path. You know what I mean? So that does happen. I mean, you go to a card shop and if they have some new cards, you'd be like, all right, I'll buy those new cards. But if they have seven different sets and they're all new to you, you're probably not going to buy all seven of them at the same time. You know, you got to be selective then. I mean, because that's exactly it. This is the second week of November for all intents and purposes. And you've got a list of one product with a date. And another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine products that are on the docket for potential November releases. There's only so many days in the month. 
So if you're talking about releasing 10 products over the course of a month, 30 days, half September, April, June, and November. So you've got 30 days in the month, right? 10 releases. Mm-hmm. You're essentially talking about a release every three days. And that's certainly not going to happen because that's not how that works. And we're already on the second week of the month. So obviously some of these are going to get bumped back. But I think more to the point of this and more to illustrate, these are sets that are still listed as potentially coming out that we haven't seen. These are regular sets that were announced and just still haven't seen the light of day. I'm excited about the top sticker set, and that'll probably come out when it's going to come out because that's tops only hockey release not counting the now stickers, which I didn't even bother to look into. Oh, but guess what? (laughs) The now stickers for this year look just like the now stickers from last year, which look like the now stickers from two years ago. They haven't changed the the design on tops now. In fact, I can attest to the fact that they haven't changed the design on the tops now in the skate app either. It's pretty much the same each Mm -hmm. year. So it's hard to tell. The only real difference between the, the now is what's in the caption as far as the date goes right so you just look at the date and see oh this was this happened you know september 13th 2022 so you know what it is versus something else but yeah the designs have been pretty much the same when it comes to those. yeah so i don't, I don't even bother with the the print on demand stickers i do like the sticker album old habits die hard i mean i've been collecting sticker albums in one form or another since uh well, hockey stickers since the 88-89 season, but even going further back to that, I, I remember trying to put together Transformers the Movie sticker album in 86 and the Masters of the Universe live action movie in 1987. And then it was really with the 88-89 Panini set. That's when I really got into like the habit of it. So I like sticker albums. They're overpriced. I mean, they're expensive. You get, what, five stickers for a buck? That's not exactly yeah. cheap, especially when you have like 600 stickers or whatever to collect. It's a lot. It's, it it's not definitely not for kids. It is, but it's not, you know? Yeah, I mean, you can gear it towards kids, but then once you get, it gets ridiculous after a certain point because no kid's going to sit there and spend $150 on stickers. Just big kids like me who spent probably $150 on four boxes and two albums, one that I can keep mint, and the other one I can put my stickers in. And then, you know, made a bunch of trades to get the rest of the stickers that I needed. I'm also excited about Metal Universe, because I'm a sucker for Metal Universe. And we know that's going to come out, because everybody is like, oh, PMG this and PMG that. So, of course, Upper Deck is going to put out Metal Universe. I mean, they put out that metal set that was like all the sports, Because they're like, oh, people like metal, people like PMGs, but we only have a hockey license. I know. Let's take our, um, not Allen and Ginter, what's their version of A&G? Goodwin Champions. Goodwin Champions, thank you. Like, let's take take that business model where we're just going to show Ken Griffey Jr. wearing a turtleneck sweater or Bobby Orr in a suit and tie or Wayne Gretzky in a smoking jacket. Just kidding. The great one does not smoke. And not have any of those silly team logos that cost us money or that we can't legally put on cards, right? And then they'll do a metal version of that, which they did, and everybody was, like, just paying insane insane amount of money for. So, of course, they're going to do the Metal Universe hockey. I don't see that one getting canceled, and I hope not because I want to collect it. Yeah, I don't think they'll make that one go away. Last year's was so popular that they'll leave it. It's got a lot of push behind it, so I can't see it going anywhere. So with the Hockey Hall of Fame induction coming up, I wanted to do a show about Hall of Fame-themed trading card sets. And when Tim and I were brainstorming the various sets that come out over the years, I realized there were actually a lot of sets, like seven or eight sets, maybe more. I mean, I just kind of lost count. I mean, you have stuff like Fleer Greats of the Game and like Upper Deck Century Legends, which maybe aren't Hall of Fame endorsed, but they have like Hall of Fame caliber players. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to do a show about 
Hockey Hall of Fame card sets that used illustrations because I've always been a fond of fond of that. And I know most card collectors like those sorts of cards. Again, whether it's like the Goodwin Champions or the Champs cards that have like those illustrations, or if you want to talk baseball, Diamond Kings. I mean, even though I wasn't necessarily a hardcore baseball card collector, if I got a Diamond King card, I always set it aside. I thought it looked cool. I loved the illustrations on them. When Don Russ did Ice Kings and then later Ice Masters, I tried like hell to get all of them in the 90s. I loved those illustrated upper deck hockey checklists, even though the ones from 90-91 weren't so good. But by 91-92, the illustrations on those got a lot better. You know, the other thing too, yeah, I've said I've always been a fan of illustrated cards. The thing is, is that I used to draw all the time when I was a kid. I always drew. I was always drawing. I mean, in high school, I was the cartoonist for our school newspaper my junior year and my senior year. And even going back to my sophomore year, I was a contributing cartoonist. I took four years of art class. I took a ton of drawing classes in college. I was actually an animation major, which is a lot of drawing. It is a lot of drawing. So I was always drawing. I always loved the Hockey Hall of Fame set, which we'll talk about from 1983, that had those illustrations. And that was one thing that I was inspired by. Like, oh, I want to draw this good. I want to do likenesses of specifically hockey players, but also actors, famous people, whatever. Like, I just loved that sort of thing. So that's kind of why I really wanted to talk about these kinds of cards. But then also it kind of gave our show a focus instead of like us saying, oh, and here's another set and here's another set. Because then the show would be like 19 hours long. Yeah, 19, 26. It could be any of the above. So the three sets I want to talk about, well, one of them is actually three sets unto itself. That's the Cardophilium Hockey Hall of Fame postcards, which later became a Hockey Hall of Fame trading card set. And then another Hockey Hall of Fame trading card set. We had the Hockey Hall of Fame Legends of Hockey postcards, which were issued between 1992 and 1996. And then we have 2010-11 in the game enshrined. So which one should we start with? Should we kind of go with this chronologically or? I would say go chronologically. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay. So the 1983 Hockey Hall of Fame postcard set was put out by a company called Cardophilium. I actually wrote an article about this set for Beckett Hockey, this set and its subsequent sets, and I'm going to link to it in the comments. But basically, the 83 Hockey Hall of Fame postcard set was a set of 240 cards that were sized four by six. They were like legit postcards. They had like the little area for the stamp. They had artwork by an artist named Carlton McDermott. And I love his work. And he's done other sports work. Unfortunately, he passed away over 10 years ago. So I never had the chance to interview him. But if you remember the 86, 87 craft hockey drawing set that used like those black and white illustrations, he did some of those. I think he did half of the artwork on those cards as well. So he did those. You might be familiar with those. But he did the artwork on all of these cards. They were originally sold in 15 series of 16 postcards. You could get all of them for $70 or $5 a series. There was also a binder that you could buy that at the time was 20 bucks. It came with all the pages and it had the Hockey Hall of Fame logo on the front. And I actually found out about this set later because... My introduction to this was the trading card set that used the same illustrations as the postcards. The trading card set was put out in 1985. came in a small white box. It was still 240 cards. I remember buying that from a mail order catalog in 1989. I took my eighth grade graduation money. I had a friend who gave me a mail order catalog for a company that sold complete sets of cards. I think they were in New York. And I remember from this company buying a complete 78-79 top set, complete 84-85 top set, 
and a complete Hockey Hall of Fame trading card set because it was like 10 bucks, which was affordable. And I had my graduation money. And I remember just being really blown away by the illustrations on these cards. And then on the back, they had a mini biography of each Hall of Fame member. So for me at 14, it was like my way of learning hockey history through trading cards where I would look and I'd say, oh, well, you know, of course I knew who Gordie Howe was. Of course I knew who Ken Dryden was, but I didn't know who Harry Lumley was. I didn't know who Chuck Rayner was. I didn't know who Sid Abel was. I didn't know yet who Emile the Cat Francis was. A lot of these guys, I didn't know who they were. I mean, you know, there's even like a Stanley, a Lord Stanley card. To me, it was a great set that actually went up in value over the years. Actually, just give you a few facts about this. So the standard sized card set was sold for 20 bucks. The binder was sold for 15 bucks. It had a Hockey Hall of Fame logo on the front of the binder. It was sold by Sears Canada in their Christmas catalog. Sears wanted something. They said, hey, we like these postcards, but they're kind of big and we want something around 20 bucks. So Cardophilium said, all right, we'll make them card sized so that it's that $20 price point. Uh, it was also sold by mail order companies. Like I said, I bought mine from a company in New York. It was also sold by the Montreal Gazette, although they sold it in 20 card series. And then they also had a special binder that had the Gazette logo on it, as well as the Hockey Hall of Fame logo on it. And then the set was put out a third time in 1987. And two things are unique about the set from 87. One is that it has 261 cards instead of 240 cards. And two, it has complete player statistics. So let me just explain a couple things here. 1983 set should have had 242 members, but they could only fit 240. So they omitted Bobby Hall and Harry Sinden because they had to make the set 240 cards. And they were planning on putting them out later. Well, later was 87. They included Bobby Hall, Harry Sinden, and then everyone else who was inducted in 84, 85, 86, and 87. So the set has 261 cards, and it has newer inductees like Serge Savard, Phil Esposito, Jacques Lemaire, Bernie Perrant, Bobby Clark, John Ziegler, the former uh, NHL president, Ed Jockaman. So it's just got like a lot of the newer guys who were inducted in the, the mid to late 80s. The other thing is that the postcards did not have stats on them because they didn't want to make some players seem better than other players. But also at the same time, they didn't have all the stats for the Pacific Coast Hockey Association. And you had guys like Cyclone Taylor who really made a name for themselves in the, the uh, Pacific Coast League. So it was a little unfair to be like, well, here's all of Gordie Howe's stats, but we don't have Cyclone Taylor's stats or we don't have Lester Patrick's stats. But by 87, all those stats had finally been compiled. So the 87 Hall of Fame set has stats on the back. So that, that's how you could tell. Uh, well, that and the copyright date. The 85 set actually has an 83 copyright and the 87 set has an 87 copyright. So I don't know if you ever bought any of these cards or, or uh, have seen them or have the set. Yeah, I have individual cards from the 85 set, but I don't have any of the postcards. There's been many times where I've toyed with the idea of buying it because you can find people selling complete sets of these but i just never have bit the bullet on them i've pricey. actually yeah they Most are kind of, of pricey and there was actually a set one time that i was going to get that was un unpulled from the uh from the the pack the little ticket packets that they came the, the postcard sleeves yeah yeah so they had the the postcard sleeve holder things that they came in mm -hmm. they had all series a through o like mm -hmm. fully intact uh with the staples on top and everything and i i was this close to biting on it and i'm just like ah, i just can't justify it i think the reason why i, I convinced myself that i didn't want it because it didn't come with that vinyl leathery looking binder so i was just like nah, i'm not doing it but that was the one time i saw that so i've never gotten the postcards but i do have some individual I'm pretty sure all the ones I have are from 85. I don't think I have any of the 87 ones. But I saw 
And I don't know if you know about these or not, but I saw them because you mentioned how you could get these. But it looked like they were being sold retail. And I don't know if that was like a, something that was bought and redone. But you mentioned how the Gazette, you could mail order them and they were in packs of 20. These are packs of 30. And they have like a little tab on top with a grommet, a little peg hook grommet hanger. Like they were mm -hmm. hooked on peg hooks for a retail shop. I don't know if you've ever seen those before. I haven't, but I yeah. mean, that wouldn't surprise me, especially with the way things got packed and repacked in the 80s and the 90s. Somebody couldn't sell something, so then it ended up getting repacked and sold a different way. So it's possible. Yeah, that's the only real thing extra that I wanted to add. Have you seen the promo cards? Yeah, I have four of ten. Four, four out of the ten promo cards, which so basically where... they have the same artwork on the front, but then on the back. They just have like a little blurb that says Hockey Hall of Fame Collection, set of 240. And it's it like an advertisement. The price. Like an advertisement, right? Basically, yeah. Where were those given out? Like, where did those promos come out? They probably were given to retailers, you know, because the okay. whole idea of promo cards was they'd get sent to retailers so that they would know what they look like and then they would order them. I mean, that was the whole idea. Right. And I get that. I mean, it's basically your model and try to sell it based off of the model. But I didn't know if that was something that was released to like dealers or retailers themselves or, or what. I didn't know how those went. I mean, so probably, I yeah, dealers and retailers, same difference. You know, proof of concept. Oh, okay, that's what these cards look like. All right, I'll order a set or a case or whatever. I just didn't know any background on them. That's why I was wondering if you knew how those were distributed. Because I know I've seen the, the Bellavo one and it's blank doesn't have a back to it never saw that one before yeah all of them have like the ads and stuff on them but the the bellabo one doesn't have anything on the back i'll tell you one thing i bought i should probably put these in the comments at least one of them the first three series or so so a b and c what they did is they would take photos of the paintings and then they would make a giant negative which they would use for printing. Actually, it was a positive. So it was like a film slide that was like the same size as the postcard. And yeah. then with the subsequent series, the printing process changed. So it was only for like the first three series of cards. And I remember buying them on eBay and getting into like crazy bidding wars over these because I'm obsessed with this set. So it was just like, Oh my God, Lester Patrick, I need to have that. And I was bidding on it. And I think after like 130 bucks, I was just like, all right, I can't afford this. And I didn't even try with like any of the big guys because those went for like hundreds of dollars. But I ended up buying like the four that I could afford. But I do have Harry Apple Cheeks Lumley. And that's like one of my favorites. And like sometimes like I'll hold it up in the windowsill so that it's like backlit by the sunlight and it just looks so flipping cool. I mean, if you like paintings of guys who played, you know, 80 years ago. <laughs> I think most collectors would appreciate that. You're going to get cards of players, and yeah, sure, they're not cards per se. They're postcards or the individual cards themselves. But your chance of actually owning a real card of these guys, if they even existed, because some of the players played before cards were made. So, I mean, you don't really have stuff from them. And if they did appear on cardboard, it was like a highlight card or another painting like from the early Parker sets or something like that where it showed like a flashback to a different time period. Not only that, it's not just the players. You got all the builders. You mm -hmm. got all the, the coaches and the referees and the owners and the executives and everything else that are in the Hall of Fame as well. Lord Stanley's first card is in the 83 set, the 83 postcard set and the 85 trading card set. His first one that he ever appears on? Yeah. Really? You could consider that his rookie card because he did not have any cards before that one. Huh. It's interesting that his cup made it on cards before he did. <laughs> well, that's what made this set so cool. I mean, I remember showing it to friends and they'd be like, it's a bunch of old guys. I don't care. Like, it wasn't interesting to them. But to me, it was like, oh, but this is the guy who, you know, this is the guy who is basically considered the father of hockey programs and 
this is the guy who did this, and this is the player who did that. I mean, it's even funny. It's got a card of everybody in Chicago's least favorite team owner, Bill Wirtz, but he actually has a card in the set. He was elected in 1976, and believe it or not, I did send it to him. I ended up with an extra set, so I ended up sending him the card to get signed. Even though I wasn't a fan, I'm like, well, he is in the Hall of Fame, and he did sign it, and he sent it back. He sent it back and didn't charge you to send it back? I can't believe that. Yeah, I'm surprised he didn't, like, black it out somehow or something. Yeah, it wasn't blacked out? (laughs) He did send me a season reservation holder form, as he called them. He didn't call it season tickets. He always said the season reservation holders is what he called it. Like it was some sort of fancy, smancy thing. This is definitely one of those sets that, yeah, you may not be all into it because you don't know who these players are and can't identify with them. But if you're a historical fan of hockey, these sets, whether it's the postcards or the 85 or 87 set, if you can get your hands on them or even your hands on maybe some of your favorite team members just to add to your collection, it's well worth it because from a historical standpoint, these are great. The only problem is, is that it ends at 87. It's already like 30, 35 years out of date at this point. Why didn't the Cardophilium set continue? And when I talked to the guy who created that set, he basically told me after Tops and OPG lost the exclusive to NHL cards in 8990 things got more complicated because prior to that if you had a license with the hockey hall of fame that basically gave you everything the players likeness team logos it was a hall of fame license but then what happened was was after that then it started becoming splintered but you still needed to get an NHL license even though it was a Hall of Fame set. So you need the Hall of Fame license, an NHL license, and then the players weren't really under that umbrella anymore. And then you had guys like Gordie Howe and Bobby Orr being exclusive with companies, mainly for like autographs, but it made it more complicated. And the other thing was, is that they couldn't do an update set every year. The next one they wanted to do was going to be a 94 because they had a certain amount of cards that they would need to print to justify making a new version of the set. And they even talked about like, well, hey, let's make a card of Gordie Howe as a whaler just to make a different card of him in like the later sets that's going to just have like another extra 40 cards beyond the 261 cards. But by then, the landscape had shifted too much in the hockey trading card market. So at this point, we had the Hockey Hall of Fame put out a set of postcards called Legends of Hockey. These were issued in five series of 18 postcards that came in little boxes. Uh, So they are three and a half by five and a half inch size cards. There were 90 total. So one series between 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. They were sold at the Hockey Hall of Fame. They were numbered to 10,000 sets. There were also unnumbered versions of the cards that don't have the serial number on the back. Instead, they say honored member. Now, here's an interesting little tidbit. I met somebody who worked with the Hockey Hall of Fame, and we actually talked about the set of cards. And I'm like, why are these cards so darn expensive? And he basically said the unsold sets were destroyed. But they took out the cards of anybody who was still alive so that they could still get them signed but then they destroyed the rest of them. Because I said, these cards should not be that expensive if there's 10,000 sets. And he said, well, we didn't want to basically mark them down to nothing because when you mark something down, it becomes worthless. And then when there's a ton of them out on the market and it's worthless, that doesn't help. So they basically destroyed what they couldn't sell, but they kept the cards of the guys who were still alive. And then those were used for autographs. And like the Hall of Fame postcards from a decade prior, these also use illustrations. Well, that's the theme of our show. And they don't really have stats on the back, but they have like really nice full color backs with like a biography. Uh, It's got career statistics, playoff statistics, year they were inducted and their other information. These are nice. These are like a nice spiritual successor to the 1983 postcards 
The other thing, though, is that they didn't get caught up in making everybody. They'd make 18, and then they'd make another 18, and they'd make another 18. Basically, a mix of hockey superstars and hockey builders so that you'd want to get them, right? Because if it's all builders from the 1930s, that's kind of a tough sell. But when you have like enough guys that people go, oh, yeah, I remember him, or I heard of him, then it's a little easier to buy. Five series, 18 cards in each series. Mm -hmm. So each series came out one per year. It's almost like the ultimate chase. It's what I hate about like Netflix series and stuff like that, where they'll release all of them and you'll watch them all at once. And then there's not another season for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you have to just Mm -hmm. wait and wait and wait and wait forever it seems like to get more of them well i think what they were trying to do was like people would come to the hall of fame once a year and they would have a new set for them to sell in the gift shop that makes sense if i mean if that's the marketing idea behind it then that makes sense i will tell you this this is going to be something i'm going to look for at the expo this weekend because i have the last series of them which I found at uh, Sports Card Spectacular in Chicago many years ago. I forgot what year I found it, but it was affordable. It was like 10 bucks, And I'm like, yes, do you have any more of these? He's like, no, that's the only one I got. I'm like, sold. It's probably something I'm going to look for. In fact, I updated my want list today to make sure that I, I knew which ones I had and which ones I needed. Like I said, they're on my radar now for something that I need to collect. Or finish collecting. These are serial numbered. Mm-hmm. Are they numbered like the actual number, or do they just say out of ten thousand? So the set that I bought is numbered nine five zero nine. So it says the card number, like here, card seventy six, card seventy seven, card seventy eight, and then it says o nine five zero nine, copyright nineteen ninety six. And so all yeah, the because, cards in the set are all the same serial number. Yeah, when you bought them as a series, yes. So what about the ones that say honored member instead of the serial number? I don't know what the deal is with those. I'd be happy to just have any of them because I like the artwork on them. So it wouldn't really matter to me if it said honored member or if it had a serial number because Mm -hmm. I'm buying it for the player pictured on the front, not the serial number on the back, so to speak. I just wonder what the difference is. If those were like released in some kind of special edition or... Maybe those were given out to people and made their way onto the secondary market somehow. Or I know I saw a couple floating around online that said honored member on them. And I thought, oh, I thought these were supposed to be serial numbered, but they have that stamp instead. So I wondered if that was something that was like a special giveaway or what or how that worked. I don't know. Something to figure out. This is interesting. I'm looking at Beckett and it just basically says here on Beckett, Production was limited to 10,000 numbered sets, and buyers retained exclusive rights to their assigned number throughout the duration of the project. Ah. So I guess if you got set number one out of 10,000, then you'd always be able to buy one out of 10,000. That's interesting. And features the work of noted sports artist Doug West. The front displays a color reproduction of the artist's original painting. The back has parchment background. Blah, 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 info, info. A registration form and ownership transfer form were included with each set. Now, the one that I bought didn't have an ownership transfer form because, you know, I would have brought that up had I, (laughs) if I had that. This is totally unrelated. But I bought a set of 93-94 Stadium Club Hockey members only boxed set that came with a special binder it came with special pages, and it comes with a certificate of ownership, and it even has a form if you wanted to transfer ownership of the set and let Tops know that, hey, I sell Barry, I'm selling the set to Tim Parrish on this date, so then it would be registered in your name or whatever. It's not exactly a car title, but it's kind of like what they were trying to make it like. But uh, it's like, anyway. I was just going to say, it's like transferring a warranty to somebody else when you sell something to them. Right. So, unfortunately, this Hall of Fame postcard set was short and sweet. It was only 90 cards, only lasted a few years. They didn't make everybody, but they seemed to focus on a lot of the big names that would have gotten people to want to buy it. Yeah. If most of it is builders, eh, it's kind of hard to want to buy. But if you got a couple of builders and a lot of players, then, yeah, that's pretty cool. Then you learn about some of the builders. It's, I mean, it's another great-looking set. It's just a lot more 
a lot more scarce, I think. Yeah, I think so too. But not as scarce as the last set we're going to talk about, which is enshrined from 1011 in the game. I know very little about this set. Wow, something I might know more about than you. The only thing I know is that it was 200 cards. They were serial numbered out of 175. Well, that's it. That's all you need to know. No more details. To that. All right. Got it. Got it Show's over, folks. Drive yeah, safe. So I have a special infinity for Enshrined, and I'll get to that in a second. So 200 cards in the set. All of them are, in fact, serial numbered out of 175. So there were only 7,000 serial numbered packs produced for this entire set. Now, keep in mind, this is 2010, 2011, and this is in the game. So we're getting we're getting later in the, you know, the sun's starting to go down on in the game at this point. Uh, so this is a, a later set for them. And you had this as a high end release. So if you think of how most of the premium sets are now where you buy them in the boxes, you know, you buy a box of cards, but technically your box is really just a pack and there's a few cards in that so this is kind of the same way but all the way back to 2010 so it's a very high-end release there was one hit in every pack all the autographs that are mixed throughout this set nothing's numbered higher than 49 out of all of them Um, there's relic cards none of the relic cards are numbered higher than nine i repeat nine nine so yeah, nine. Not none, but nine. A lot of them are one of ones uh, because there's a, there's so few. Um, but again, 7,000 serial numbered packs. Now, the packs themselves, you would probably call it a box, but it's actually a pack. And they were five packs in a, a an actual box box. And then there were 10 boxes in a full-size case. So if you pulled out a box, and I'm using air quotes again, you would get five packs. So you're talking six cards per pack, five packs per box. So 30 cards if you bought a box. Now, keep in mind, at the time when these were released, back in April of 2011, that made these about 67 bucks a pack. So if you think about that, 67 bucks a pack for six cards. In 2010, that's kind of nuts. I think pretty much the only thing out at that time that was higher than that that I could think of was the cup. Uh, maybe there was a Panini product. Dominion. I think Do- that was Dominion the first might year have been Panini years. So Dominion yeah, came out that year. Dominion might have been pretty high too, but sixty-seven bucks a, a pack is a lot. So yeah, so you have very low number and everything on the hits that are that are in there but the coolest thing about these cards is the artwork the artwork is i think fantastic on these cards so the artwork was done by an artist named paul madden um, and some people that f- like sports art and follow sports art may recognize the name of paul madden because paul does a lot of commission sports related artwork you've probably seen his work he does a lot of like what look like almost like lithograph type pictures with collages and different theme type things. I've even seen like on Com C, somebody's got his, I don't know if they're considered like original, like the originals that the copy prints were made from, but they're all the Sport King series uh, artwork that's available i think there's like a patrick wah one that i saw that's pretty cool looking but at any rate he does a lot of sports artwork and these are really good they have kind of like an old school feel to them and you know we talk a lot about sp being tons of white space on Mm -hmm. like spa cards there's a ton of white space on these base cards but i think they're very impressive to look at because they're extremely clean and some of them, if you put them together on a page in a book, you almost can't even tell they're drawings because they almost look like photographs uh, until you get up close. You know, and we'll post some pictures of, of what some of these look like, but they're very simple, but the design 
is kind of elegant. So there's a player photo in the center, almost like an oval shape that frames them off. And, you know, it shows the player name, obviously, on the front and when they were inducted into the Hall of Fame. As simple in design as they are, they're elegant. If a card could be elegant. Elegant is a great word. And, you know, one thing that we've talked about quite a bit and sometimes maybe make fun of a little bit is with these sets that don't have league licenses, they go through extreme lengths to hide the team logos, whether it's just airbrushing it out or drawing the player with their hand over their chest so that you can't really see their logo or their body turned sideways or whatever. But by using a portrait of the player, it doesn't matter that there's no team logo. We get this nice close up of the, the player's face nice like head and a little bit of their shoulders and then it's in an oval so it has that look of like an old time photograph portrait that was like in an oval you know what i'm talking about right things that were in my grandparents house exactly and that's part of what makes it feel really classy is that it has that old timey and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean that in a nostalgic way it has that old time old timey look to it and, uh, I mean, you can almost imagine these in sepia tone, though I'm glad they're not because the colors are nice, obviously. Uh, especially I'm looking at Marcel Dion right now, and it has his purple and gold Kings jersey, which is fantastic. And, you know, another thing, too, is that it has a lot of the newer guys because this set was made in 2011. So, I mean, of course, you're going to have some of the legends from the 30s the 40s the 50s and 60s all the way to the 80s but then you're getting guys like Marcel Dion and Ray Bork and Guy Lafleur and Marc Messier who are more recent inductees so it's not just like here's a bunch of guys from the 30s 40s 50s etc it's it's a good range of players from all eras and not only that considering the year that it came out it runs it all the way up into the first females being elected into the Hall of Fame. There's an and, Angela James card. Yes. And there's also a Cameron Granado. Nice. Uh, and so, yeah, elegance, the best word I can use to describe these just because of how well I think they're designed. Now, the backs of the cards have a very large snapshot of the player statistics on them. It doesn't have all of the statistics, though. So if you're looking for like all sorts of information about their playing days, you won't find it on the back of the card, but you will find the games played, the goals, assists, points, and they do focus on penalty minutes, <laughs> which I find interesting because of all the other stats you could include, penalty minutes is what they include. Even with cards of players like Newsy Lalonde, who was elected into the Hall of Fame in 1950, they still kept stats for penalty minutes back in 1906 so not to refute you but i'm looking at ray bork's card and it actually has his full regular season stats from 79 to 80 all the way to 2000 2001 it has the years but i'm talking about the categories it's games played goals assists points and penalty minutes they don't put anything else on the back well what else do you need there's all sorts of stats that show up on cards sometimes you know, time on ice, you know, th- th- oh, that gets put on cards that a lot. Until, like, the... there's, but there's tons of information they could put on the stats, but I just think it's interesting that that's all they chose. It doesn't have Jack Adams Corsi stat. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad. I think it's cool. Of all no. the things you're going to put on there, goals and assists make sense and points. Yeah. Games played. Great. But penalty minutes, because that's what's important. Time they spent in the penalty box. I like that. I think it's cool. But the back also has it has a little blurb about the player. It's just a couple sentences about the player, but then the serial number is also stamped on the back out of 175. The reason why I have such an affinity for this set, as everybody knows, I only chase high-end sets, and I only buy high-end. So it should come as no surprise that this was a set that I... I went and bought no i'm just kidding i never buy any anything high end so you're the only friend the, i know who the, bought the cup ever in my entire life yeah you bought a box of the cup one time just one time in my entire life yes i did 
and just you're to the see only what friend I have who ever bought the cup. Um, okay. I mean, I know plenty of people that have bought the cup, but. And you have more friends than I do, I guess. I suppose if we're talking actual friends, well, that's a different oh, story. But I know sorry. people that bought the All cup. bets are off then. Back to the point, I'm usually a set collector, so I'm building base cards. You know, a high-end set is generally a, a no-no for you that if you're building base sets because the odds of you putting it together are slim to none. Now add in the fact that these are numbered out of 175. The thing is, once I saw one, I had to have them. So I decided to start collecting the entire set. And it started with the box that I bought. Now it helped that after I opened the box that I opened and I couldn't even wait to get it home when I bought it. And this was, again, a month after it got released. So I bought this in May of 2011. It came out in April. I opened it right there in the shop at the counter because I, I couldn't wait. As I did that, and it was close to closing time, and there were a few stragglers left in the store, and they were watching me open this and see everything that was coming out of it. Two other people that were in the store bought boxes as well because they saw what was coming out of it, and they thought, that's awesome. So they bought boxes as well. So I helped my local card shop make a little bit of money that day. I will say that. So that, that's one thing. Uh, the other part is this is the first box I ever bought where I opened a pack of cards and got a Mario Lemieux autograph out of an actual pack. Um, so the autograph cards that are included in these have that same circular photo. And it's the similar photo as the one that's on the base card, but it's smaller and it's black and white. It says autograph real big and leaves a space at the bottom where the player signed and they're all on card. The autograph that I got is a silver version which if you heard what I said earlier, the print run max on those is only uh, 49 total. There's 50 autographs. The gold version is number one of one. So 49 of them are silver. One of them is gold. So that's the one time I ever pulled a Mario out of a pack signed. So that was pretty awesome. Um, that is awesome. But yeah, as far as the set goes, here's the thing. As much as I love this set, I can't necessarily recommend people go out and try to build this set. And here's why. Because of the price tag on them, remember, a pack was 67 bucks back then. If you can find this still sealed, it's fairly expensive. But individual cards of the people that actually purchase these, them trying to unload them on the secondary market, base cards are anywhere from four to five bucks on up. So the absolute base cards of the players or builders that you've probably never heard of, unless you study the Hockey Hall of Fame, are going to cost you four or five bucks a piece. So building a set of 200 cards, let's say they were all five bucks a piece, it's going to cost you a lot of money to put that set together. And that's assuming they were all five bucks a piece. Star players, um, much more prominent and recognizable names are, are going to run you a lot more money. But they're so nice, though. They're just so nice. And they feel good, too. You know, the, the fronts of the cards are in full color, you know, with the portrait and everything. They're high gloss. They're on heavy cardstock. You know, they're almost on the same cardstock as, like, the slugs that you get out of the packs. The, mm -hmm. You know, you're your decoy cards, being able to see something like that and pull them out of packs like that. It's really cool. What makes it look even better is when you stick it in a binder, these in a binder together, they're awesome. They look great. And I really wish there was like some kind of branded binder, like we had on the other illustrated sets mm -hmm. for this specific set that could make it nice. I decided to spruce it up a little bit and I got a nice little leather bound binder, three ring binder to put the pages in and everything to make it look nice and kind of stand out. But I'm still building the set to this day. So one that I started in 2011, I'm still trying to build. I pick up a card here and there, but again, they're not, they're not easily attainable, especially in person. You can find them online a lot, but when you go to shows and things like that, it's very rare that you'll find people that have the individual base cards available to purchase so and that part of that is the fact that they're only out of 175 so you know with 7,000 total boxes and they were all serial numbered on the bottom um, of each pack they had the serial number on the bottom so they're also hand collated too if 
found that out. Oh, hand packed, you mean? Everything was hand done. There was no machine used in any of this. I appreciate that, especially for something, you know, with like you only get like six cards in a pack. You want to not get six duds. I mean, usually those you kind of get like a good mix where you get like, okay, it's a base card of a good player and it's a jersey card of an okay player. And you know, like you want to have like a variety. It sucks when you just like when you pull six blanks, so to speak, from a pack that's. You know, that's like a high end. I mean, you expect that from like a set uh, where you go, oh, it's all base cards or it's all base cards of just nobody players. But it's like that's like a big set. You know, if, if you buy a pack of Upper Deck Series 1 or Okichi or whatever. But if you're buying something that's a lot of money, I got to tell you, though, man, 67 bucks a pack or something like that sounds like a bargain in 2022. It really does. Sure, and that's why I brought that up because I'm like 67 bucks. That was a lot in 2010, 2011. You know, yeah, that was, but that was definitely high sets. end. Looking at like the Hall of Fame sets from '83, I mean, 70 bucks to buy the whole series to postcards was a lot of money in 1983. When an Opeachy pack was 35 cents, so you figure that a whole box of Opeachy cards might have been 14 dollars at that time, and here's you know, Hall of Fame card set for $70, you know, although the smaller sets were like 20 bucks, but still in 1985, that was a lot of money. I mean, I think about 20 bucks as a kid in 1985, I was rich. I can go buy a GI Joe vehicle, a good one, or a good transformer or something for that kind of money. So, I mean, it's, it's all relative though. I would have blew all that at the local convenience store and bought a bunch of garbage pail kids and candy. In 85? Yeah, pretty much. 85, that was when I started collecting sports cards. That's when I made the conscious decision to buy 85 Tops Baseball. And the rest is history. Yeah, I um, didn't quite transition to that yet. 86 was when I jumped in. But 85, I was definitely buying Garbage Pail Kids. Oh, yeah, those were huge. Yeah, but... um, couldn't have afforded a set like this in the game and shrine back then. No. But, uh, that was fun. Like I said, that was my essentially my second adventure into high end, and it was one that was all for me rather than something that was a split case. I definitely enjoyed opening that. I still enjoy it. To the, I have all the pictures from when I opened it. I took a picture of the case. I took a picture of the box, the inside boxes, the packaging material. I was so excited about it. I love this set to this day. And I wish I could easily complete it, but I'm still probably a good couple hundred dollars away <laughs> from from. How many cards it. do you think you need out of two hundred? Sixty-five. Okay, so you got like you got one hundred and thirty-five cards so far. Yes, that's pretty awesome, actually. That yeah, I mean, took a lot of work. Yeah, like two thirds of the set now. I mean, that's. It took a That's lot of work. Fun, though, and when, I, you, when you get that, when, when, well, when you get it, you, you're going to feel great about it. I will tell you what helped me. A couple years later, one of the guys that bought one of those boxes upon seeing me open it came back into the store and was essentially selling a big part of his collection. The owner bought them and he told the owner, because all these cards were in there, all of his base cards. He's like, hey, if you ever see that guy that opened this box a couple years ago, these are his. Hmm. And so the next time I was in there, the store owner hands me them, and he's like, here you go. I'm like, what are those for? And he's like, oh, you remember remember when Bob opened that box, blah, blah, blah. Well, he sold me a bunch of stuff, and he left these for you. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> so that basically doubled what I had from the case that I opened. So, yeah, I think I'm down to 65 I have a couple big names that I need, but most of them are the -the off-the-wall guys that most people don't probably identify with. I think I still need, like, Guy Lafleur and Timmy Donuts I still need. So, yeah, you know, we focused on these because they feature those illustrations, and I think they're really cool. They look really nice, and they're definitely historical in nature. So, you know, for those of you that are much more into your collections beyond the buying and selling and all that kind of stuff and are looking for something to get closer, closer to the game to use a overused phrase. This definitely does it for you for sets like this. Yeah. And one last thing I'll say is another thing that's nice about the artwork. 
is that it gives it a cohesive look. Whereas if it was a bunch of different photos from different eras, you'd have some that are black and white, you'd have some that are color, you'd have like a lot of posed shots from like the early days of hockey because action photography wasn't all that back then. So the thing about using artwork is that it gives the sets a unified look instead of like, here's a bunch of color photos, oh, and here's a few black and white photos that don't really fit in. And I think that's another thing that made me appreciate these sets is just the illustrated look was great, but it also kind of just unified all the players from the different eras and made them feel like one yeah, the con- collective the cons- Hall of Fame. Right, the consistency is there. Like you brought up the Diamond Kings earlier, the consistency is there because they're using the same artists and the same same style. So Cohesive, that's a good word. Cohesive's a great word. Well, all right then. Thank you for listening to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed the show, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you have a minute, go write a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. That would be a huge help to us. If you want to support this podcast, you could do so by buying a shirt at shop.puckjunk.com. Please give me a follow on Twitter at Puck Junk. Please give Tim a follow on Twitter at the real DFG. And until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.